Uh, good evening, folks. Um, I will now uh, call this meeting to order on a standing committee on accountability and oversight. Um, and I want to welcome uh, any of our viewers who are joining in. Um, and just to start off the introductions, my name is Steve Norn. I am the MLA for Tunida Willida and a chair of this committee. <coughs> And normally with the off on our agenda, we have a prayer to start off with, but uh, seeing as we did the prayer earlier today and uh, in session, I think we could forego that. Um, so going back to the agenda here, number two item here is the, redu uh, sorry, is the review and adoption of the agenda. Um, so, um, Mr. Clerk, uh, can we uh, can you speak to that item? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, you have one item on your agenda, uh, which is a the uh, presentation and briefing, and then following that, uh, there will be an in-camera uh, wrap-up for AOC members. Okay. I'll see Mr. Clerk. Um, so I don't hear, uh, I don't think we have any changes. I don't hear any. So can I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Emily Johnson. Emily Johnson has moved the adoption of the agenda. The motion is in order. And all those in favor, all those opposed, Motion is carried. And the next item here is uh, back to the agenda on uh, conflict of interest. Uh, are there any uh, uh, conflict of interest? I don't hear any. I will do as and when. Just bear with me. I'm just going to make a quick note. And. Uh, just a reminder for everybody, today's meeting is uh, being live streamed on the Assembly's social, social media channels, excuse me, and presentation materials will, will be available on the Legislative Assembly's website after the meeting has concluded. Um, to respect uh, physical distancing requirements, all the witnesses will be attending by video conference. And uh, I'd like to all remind all members and our witnesses that all comments, questions, and remarks will need to be directed to myself as the chair. And in addition, both members and the witnesses will need to be waiting to be recognized by the chair before speaking. And so with that, we'll go in back to introductions. Um, so I'll ask the members to introduce themselves in the room to start. And uh, we'll start to my left, starting with Emily Johnson. Alan Johnson, MLA for Yellow Knife North. Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Wasi Cho, and we'll go online. We'll get start with uh, Emily Cleveland. Caitlin Cleveland, MLA Cam Lake. Cho. Jack Lafferty, MLA Murphy. Okay, Masi Cho, uh, um, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Masi Cho. Uh, Emily Jacobson. Okay, thank you, uh, members. I'll ask the um, Honorable Premier to introduce herself, other witnesses, and to proceed with any opening remarks. And uh, with that, the line is yours, uh, Madam Premier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, committee members. Uh, thank you for providing the opportunity for discussion about the plans for operations of the 2021 Tibet to Quantuito Winter Road and the plans put in place by the Joint Ventura in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure the safety of both workers and NWT residents. With me, video conference video, is Mr. Mike Lowey, the Director of the Winter Road Operations, and uh, I believe uh, Michael Conrad, the MD Director of Medical Director, Deputy Med Medical Director, Tibet to Quantuito Winter Road Joint Ventura. From the COVID-19 Coordinating Secretariat, I have Associate Deputy Minister, Mr. Russ Nordoff, and Dennis Marchirio, probably didn't say that right, sorry, <laughs> Director of Compliance and Enforcement Operations with the Secretariat. They're both present with me today. We all know the importance of the Tibet to Quito Winter Road to the economy of our territory. The road is critical to the resupply of mines located to the north of Yellowknife, it also provides access to mineral exploration projects and to abandoned contaminated mine sites for federal remediation projects. The joint venture is responsible for operating the winter road and they've taken significant steps to address the risks associated with construction and operation of the road during the pandemic. 
With the approval of the chair, I'd like to propose that Mr. Lowing share his presentation with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn it back to you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam uh, Premier, and uh, with that, um, uh, Mr. Lowing, um, you could uh, proceed with your presentation. Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Lowing. I'm the director for the Winter Road Operations for the Tibet to Contrite to Winter Road Joint Venture, and I'd first like to wish everybody a happy Ice Road Day in the NWT. It's, uh, today is the day that we've opened up our Ice Road. I would like to note that also on the line, and I'm hoping the audio is working a lot better for him than it is for me, is Dr. Um, Michael Conrad, who is our Deputy Medical Director, uh, I'll let, uh, who comes from the sunny uh, parts of BC. Uh, I'll let Dr. Conrad introduce himself. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Norn and other committee members uh, on the Standing Committee of uh, Accountability and Oversight. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet with you here this evening. Folks, uh, we have about a 15-minute presentation, so uh, we'll pitter-patter, we'll, uh, we'll get at it right here. So we'll, uh, I see we're on slide number two, and uh, which uh, is our health and safety share, and then the uh, at the, uh, the Tibet to Contuito Winter Road Joint Venture, we always start every meeting, regardless of the size, with a health and safety share. And I would like to show you something that you probably may or may not be aware of. And uh, it's been a challenging year for us, and we'll talk a bit about that beyond just COVID. Uh, earlier in uh, December, when we started construction, and we always uh, start the southern section, about mid-December, we had a piece of equipment break through in a small slough located south of White Lake, uh, about, uh, let's say, about 80 to 75 kilometers up the Winter Road. And in this situation, an operator went from what we call profiled and safe ice onto unsafe ice uh, while he was multitasking, trying to get that extra little bit of ice cleared. And as you can see, his piece of equipment broke through. And something uh, we all know about northern lakes, this was more of a northern slough, and the unit went down on about 26 inches of water. Well, as you can see there, it's down more than 26 inches, and when that piece of equipment touched the very soft bottom of the loon muck, it sank. And uh, But it was like a slow motion sinking, and the operator was to get out. And, of course, we're, we finished our investigation, and, you know, following procedures is always very important in any workplace, and ensuring that you monitor your people to follow procedures is just as critical. However, we found in this situation that the noise of COVID was a factor in the incident, and that mm, the crew had been distracted by COVID, all the changes... Everything we've done to them to make them safer creates barriers. And in this situation, the operator even admitted that he was he was distracted and this event did occur. So as leaders, we focus on the controls that we have. And when we have new risks, making sure that it doesn't drown out the things that we have that are existing to us. We'll move to slide three. The uh, quick overview of the road and slide three and... Uh, the Winter Road is essentially operated, it's a joint venture that's operated by the three diamond mines in the Northwest Territories. We have the De Beers Canada uh, Gautroque mine site. We have the Rio Tinto Davic diamond mine site uh, located due north. And beside it, we have the new, well, it's the old Acadie mine site, but it's being operated now by the new owner of Arctic uh, Canadian Diamond Mining Company Limited. Those three companies make up the joint venture who I work for, and they build and fund and cover off a road that spans over 400 kilometers from Yellowknife to the furthest mine site, which is the Caddy. 85% is built on the lakes of the road, with 55 portages uh, making up the remainder, but 15% uh, that cover 42 kilometers of the road. We have three camps that operate to support, uh, the, essentially to the construction and operations. In the north section of the Lac de Gras camp, we have the uh, Nuna, uh, Nuna de Toncho, Winter Road Services a Joint Venture, and in the southern section for the Lockhart Camp, which is Midpoint, and the Dome Camp, which is the first one, we have DTR, First Nations Construction Corp. At its peak, we'll have about 160 people working in the camps with 95, uh, 160 people working on the project with 95% based in the camps, and that doesn't include the drivers. All right, we'll go to the next slide, number four, please. The, uh, we're ex this year expecting almost 600 drivers to be coming up to, uh, to join us on the road. It's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of the drivers that will come up on the winter road will stay in what we call the NWT bubble. With an average cycle time of about 2.3 days, 
Uh, it's what it takes the drivers to get from Yellowknife up to a mine site and back. Going south doesn't serve what they want to do, which is to make money. And the average driver will do between 20 to 25 trips over the ice road season. Full construction started uh, of the camps, as I mentioned. Some construction started in the middle of December, but you can see that uh, on December 27th, both, all three of our camps went into full staffing and full construction with an opening uh, of today, February 8th. And we'll go to the next slide. This year's uh, winter road, as you can see, um, gives a breakdown. And this, this information is uh, generally just we keep it to the joint venture, but gives you an idea of the number of loads that are going up the road and the historical perspective. And you can see here that the largest uh, loads is going up the Divac Diamond Mines, followed by De Beers Gotchakwe Mine, and uh, the, the new, uh, I should say, the Akati Mine uh, is the smallest amount. Overall, loads are down. Uh, for this season, a thousand loads from the, from last year, and if you were to look at the the, the five year average, historically the loads are decreasing um, from about uh, 2018 to 2013. The average load was about 8,300 per year, so you can see quite a dramatic shift. We'll proceed to slide number six, and uh, this is just to give you a quick overview of of the winter road and uh, the organizational structure and. It's not just a bunch of guys running up and down the road with graders. As you can see, you know, we have a, a medical director. We have a large health and safety component. We have the northern section operations and the southern section, which I described. We have our winter road operations group, which are the security personnel, a complete dispatch services, and an entire engineering and environmental team to support the activities that span three and a half months. We'll go to slide number seven. Here you can see, folks, we have uh, what's our biggest threat this year? Well, we have a number of challenges on the road, and this year ice has been very, very challenging for us. And right now, so is the weather. We've opened up our first day, and within two and a half hours, had to close the road because of a large storm way up in the McKay, McKay Lake area, about 300 kilometers up. But our biggest challenge this year, as it is for every everyone in the Northwest Territories, has been COVID-19. And, uh, of course, we worry about all the tr truck drivers coming in, but we also worry about our winter road camps, where we combine both southern and northern workforces, much in the same way that our joint venture partners do at their mine sites. And you can, uh, you can see here that uh, we worry about the chance of transmitting COVID back into the communities, and we know that it's a reality for the government. Across Canada, as we, uh, the numbers you see there, it's an old slide, we're now currently down to about 39,000 active cases. So... There is a downward trend, but it doesn't eliminate the risk for us on the winter road. And now we're going to go to uh, the next slide, which is our COVID-19 management. As you can see here, uh, we, we love our flow charts on the winter road, but the, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the biggest challenge for us is developing a plan that meets the requirements of the CPHO and of the WSCC. So we work very closely with all the entities to ensure that in all situations we have met, and in most situations exceeded the requirements set up by the CPHO. And I'll begin to, in this presentation, we'll now get into the, the key components of, of what those major control points are for managing COVID. And Glenn, if we could move to slide number nine, please. First off, uh, I think most importantly, is the Winter Road has adopted a medical model. It's not just Mike Lowing or this ice road building and operations team making decisions around COVID. We have Dr. Nick Withers, and actually I have to give some acknowledgement here, and Dr. Uh, Conrad, who is with us. Um, Dr. Conrad, as I mentioned before, is the, uh, the deputy medical director for us. So Dr. Conrad and Dr. Withers um, will act as our medical liaison. They provide clear and ultimate medical direction for us on managing COVID. They also continually talk to and liaise with Dr. Candola and Dr. Andy Delapizzi. Uh, both uh, Dr. Conrad and Dr. Withers uh, are very involved in the COVID management programs uh, for Rio Tinto and for the Akati Diamond Mine and are also uh, very involved in the Trans Mountain Pipeline as the main medical provider. So they have extensive experience in remote and northern operations. Perhaps, um, Dr. Conrad, you could talk a bit about uh, the services that uh, your company was providing for us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Noy. Uh, Dr. Conrad. Thank you, Mr. Noy. 
Um, yes, yeah, so as outlined, we've provided uh, to industry, uh, industrial clients, uh, COVID screening and management uh, services uh, since the early into 2020. We want to ensure that the workforce heading to any given site is uh, as reasonably clear of, of uh, transmitting or having COVID as one can possibly be. It's a tricky virus and it manages to do its own thing, but to the extent that it is possible, we've taken measures to um, prevent that. So we do telephone screening of workers before they come in. We do uh, airport screening. We do uh, PCR testing on arrival to sites such as at the Divic mine. And uh, to date, we've conducted thousands of, of uh, telephone screening and uh, thousands of, of PCR tests. And I think the, the testament to, to that work is the extremely low positivity rate that we have compared to the positivity rate of testing of the general population. And so I think those measures to, are very important in, in keeping the, the virus at bay from uh, these sites. And uh, the, we've gained a lot of experience in doing that uh, over the last number of months. So I think we're in a, in a good position to provide those similar services to the Winter Road. And um, I think the other point I just want to make at this um, time in the presentation is that all of our work is in close uh, concert and in essentially lockstep, uh, lockstep, I'd say, with the CPHO so that uh, the work we do are in alignment with their efforts as well. And, and um, we try to make sure that uh, everything is uh, done uh, in accordance with the government of the Northwest Territories uh, um, requirements. Back over to you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Dr. Conrad. Uh, Mr. Noy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Norn, and thank you, Dr. Conrad. Uh, we'll move to the next slide with slide 10, please, which is the pre-travel medical clearances, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Conrad already spoke to it, and we are following the same models that have been used very successfully with the joint venture partners and the remote mine sites, and we uh, screen uh, through uh, Dr. Withers and Dr. Conrad all of the employees coming from the south, and we do screening, of course, here in Yellowknife, and we'll talk a bit about the screening for the northerners, but the priority that we focus on is, is on the southerners, as you can see here, and um, the, the biggest point is that people are screened before they come to the Northwest Territories, and if they don't pass the screening process, they are not allowed to go up. Uh, and not, we, we don't allow them to travel up. We don't allow them to go up the winter road, and again, we're checking for signs and symptoms of COVID, but also compliance to the government uh, the government uh, as a requirements for remote workers so that uh, in terms of the enhanced physical distancing that they're required to do prior to coming to uh, the Northwest Territories. If we could move to slide number 11. And this is uh, the COVID testing component uh, that uh, Dr. Conrad alluded to. We have engaged in and have begun testing all personnel that go up the winter road, um, even for myself, if I'm going to go up and visit um, any one of our operations, I require a COVID test, even though I'm only there for a short period of time. All personnel are, are going up. Uh, they're being tested prior to going to the camp and must have a negative test prior to actually either driving by road or traveling into the camps. Um, we also do exit testing. Uh, so at the end of a person's rotation, whether it's two or four weeks, uh, they are tested and confirmed to be COVID-free, COVID-negative, before leaving um, any of the operating camps or facilities that we are, have on the winter road. We are currently reviewing and we'll probably be uh, looking very strongly at implementing a testing cycle at day seven. So in reality, those folks working on the winter road will be tested three times. Um, right now, we're just assessing how the private provider can accommodate uh, this increased volume, and we are working with a northern company and all the tests essentially uh, and with actually one of our joint venture partners that uses their lab at the northern part uh, to ensure the testing is done. Um, I'll actually at this point uh, get Mr. Sorry, Dr. Conrad to uh, offer some perspective on the scope of the testing that we are doing, Mr. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Lowing. Uh, Dr. Conrad. 
Yes, so the, it's uh, mentioned already, the PCR testing is uh, done on all the individuals before they uh, come up to camp and they would require a, a negative test. Um, then on departure uh, as well. And then, of course, if they become symptomatic while they're at camp, further testing is uh, conducted. And uh, this is um, a PCR test, so it's a, it, there's two different types of tests uh, involved uh, in COVID testing, uh, generally an antigen or a PCR. This is the, the PCR testing. Um, it, if we do have a symptomatic person, we would also test uh, them at site and take that down to Stanton for the certified lab uh, that is uh, uh, at that facility. But uh, we can, for example, um, at DIVEC right now, we're upwards of 10,000 PCR tests completed with uh, only five positive cases. So, um, as I was saying earlier, uh, the, with the measures in place, we can't escape it entirely, but we uh, have sh uh, demonstrated a very extremely low positivity rate and um, have been able to manage things uh, successfully to date. Thank you, Dr. Conrad. Uh, Mr. Loy. Thank you, Mr. Norton. The, uh, we'll move to the next slide, and uh, I'll pick up the pace a little bit, folks, because I know it's late in the day for you. If you want to slide 12, which is our camp management, and uh, for those of you who've been in the Northwest Territories for a long time, that uh, the challenges we face, uh, our, our camps are much smaller than the larger um, diamond mines that exist uh, due north of us. And uh, in this journey, we've uh, worked with the CPHO on uh, ensuring that our accommodations, often they're shared accommodations, uh, that we don't expose to people uh, to any expo increase in the exposure potential. And for all three of our camps, we have uh, have deployed additional accommodations units uh, to, get, to bring our camps into operation and to meet CPHO requirements. The challenge, of course, is when you're moving uh, uh, sleeping accommodations up winter ice roads, you need a certain amount of ice. And unfortunately, the ice is not cooperating. So it's a, in uh, two out of our three camps, we've been able to get those units into place, but still working on the on, on the third one, which always remains a fairly substantial challenge. We'll move to slide number 13. And this is uh, talks about our winter road construction. And one of the ways we looked uh, hand on heart to manage COVID is, of course, you reduce the duration of the road. Uh, the, one of the larger influxes, of course, comes from our drivers with an estimated 600 coming into the Northwest Territories. So we've shortened the season to, again, help reduce the exposure. Traditionally, the winter ice road operates on an eight-week cycle uh, season, and in this case, we've actually uh, dropped it to seven. So uh, most of you familiar with the road would have seen it open on uh, February 1. It's actually opened on the 8th. We've also changed our crew rotations to meet government requirements uh, based on the two-week rotations. And, uh, we, and because we also started the road earlier to uh, increase our and, and to prepare for any potential COVID delays, we actually equipped all of our light vehicle fleet in the southern section to clear the ice roads uh, with pickup trucks. Now, traditionally, we've always used heavy snow clearing equipment. And uh, this year, uh, for those of you familiar with Gordon Lake, both the uh, express lane and the uh, northbound of the main hall lane were cleared using pickup trucks, a first of its type. And it's interesting how COVID has forced us to try different strategies and things out of the box and, and quite successfully. And it's a good thing we do because uh, ice was very challenging. We'll move to the next slide, which is, I think, of, of, of a lot of interest to, to folks, and is the management of the drivers. The most public side of the Winter Road is what people see is in Yellowknife in the North Slave region on Highway 3 and 4 are the trucks. And again, with over almost 6,100 trips being planned up and down the Winter Road, we uh, will get into the, the really the nitties of uh, nitty gritty of how we're going to manage the drivers. So the drivers uh, will be screened, and like for example, this morning, every driver that came into our dis dispatch facility located in Angle Park uh, came in, was re received by a medical technician uh, with a questionnaire, and we went through COVID signs and symptoms, and they had their temperature checked, and they were screened medically to ensure that they were fit for work and COVID free. And then the individuals were. Uh, are then taken to another station where another technician administered the 
P- the COVID test, as uh, Dr. Conrad pointed out, the PCR testing, and, and the, where we can verify that they are COVID-free. Our winter road drivers will be tested on day one and day seven, and only if they become symptomatic or contract tracing after that. Now, it's important to note that uh, most of these, again, as I mentioned, most of these drivers will stay in the territorial bubble. Um, and if we need to do testing, we can. But as a general rule, they become just like every other northerner when they spend the next seven weeks with us. There are a very small select group of drivers that will uh, continue to do what we call transborder movements. And uh, these are mostly specialized loads, for example, uh, specialized lubricants that need to come right from the refinery where they can't be stored in Yellowknife. Um, the bulk of our fuel, our concrete, a lot of the, the, the basic commodities that we haul up the road are actually already pre-staged here and have been brought up over the last four to five months. But the bulk lubes are an example of stuff that it, the drivers need to go right from the refineries in Edmonton all the way up to a mine site. The other commodity uh, is, a, is ammonium nitrate, or what we call prill. This is the, the bulk explosive that we use in our northern mining operations. Of course, uh, people have asked, well, why don't you bulk, bulk, do bulk storage of the ammonium nitrate in the north of the territories? And we need to be very careful that we don't introduce larger risks uh, than transborder drivers. But for those folks that are driving the border, every time they cross and come back, they have to restart that COVID testing cycle. So uh, if you stay in the bubble, it's day one, day seven. If you uh, if you go outside that bubble, we will begin daily or basically every trip testing on you. We're also giving our drivers infrared thermometers and daily monitoring cards so that they check themselves every 24 hours for symptoms. And uh, if they, if it's three weeks down the road and they're past all their COVID testing and they're not maintaining their daily monitoring, then they have to resubmit to another COVID test. And drivers from the U.S. or Canadian drivers that cross the U.S. for specialized loads will not be permitted up the winter road. They are allowed to come into the territories, drop their loads, and then drive back, but they won't be allowed to go past uh, the all knife point for, for our operational purposes. Um, many of our, we're working very closely with our carriers uh, to confirm and ensure they're meeting all the government requirements for long haul drivers. And additionally, where our, uh, most of the carriers, all, all four of the major carriers that we are working with have basically begun to separate their northern and southern drivers. So the folks that are going to assign to run to the winter road stay in the, their own version of a carrier northern bubble. And the drivers that come from the south to bring up supplies, they don't send them up the road. They recycle them, keep them separated, and then send them back down. Uh, so there's a very little interaction between those two particular types of groups. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll just check with uh, Mr. Norn if, uh, if Dr. Conrad has anything to add on how we are screening or managing the drivers from a medical COVID perspective. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Loing. Uh, do you have anything to add, um, Dr. Conrad? Uh, thank you, Mr. Norn. No, I think um, Mike has gone over it quite well, and uh, for the sake of time, I don't think there's really any important points to elaborate upon. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Conrad. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, continue on, uh, Mr. Loing. Thank you, Mr. Norn. Just a couple slides left, folks. So, I think one of the biggest things that, uh, of course, as we all are concerned in the Northwest Territories, is if we develop a COVID. Uh, 19 case. And uh, in this particular situation, um, we have a very defined plan. And so with all of all three of our, our sites located up the Winter Road, if somebody develops any sign or symptom, uh, that's it. Uh, they go see the medic, a mask is put on. Um, and whether it's a cold or influenza or COVID-19, you can't tell the difference. We're asking the people on the road not to try and attempt that difference. They're required to phone. Um, Dr. Conrad and uh, or Dr. Withers, who's ever on call, and th those two physicians will oversee the direct the medical direction of how we're going to manage those cases and how we liaise with uh, the CPHO. And actually, I, uh, Mr. Norn, I'll turn that over to uh, Dr. Conrad to talk about how that screening and medical process would be would be driven. It's not driven by the joint venture; it's actually driven by our medical directors. Thank you, Mr. Loing. Uh, Dr. Conrad. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Norn. Uh, yes, and uh, as Mike already pointed out, it actually can be very difficult to 
distinguish on a clinical basis uh, whether a person has COVID or not, in many cases uh, virtually impossible. So it really it's a very, very low threshold to uh, initiate, say, our medical protocol for it, which would be prompt isolation of the individual and uh, prompt testing. Uh, the subsequent steps uh, are uh, developed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the medical management, of course, would follow according to the clinical severity of the case. But uh, very, very early on, there would be liaison with the CPHO and, um, and a treatment evacuation plan as well as an isolation plan would be put into place so that uh, once the person comes out of their uh, from the winter road, their medical needs are met, of course, but also so is the safety of the residents of the Northwest Territories. And uh, quickly, another final piece would be uh, very early uh, contact, close contact identification and getting those people also into self-isolation or, or quarantine. Um, despite all of the best efforts, this tricky virus you know, does show up. In, and uh, so I don't think success is necessarily measured on getting zero cases. I, I think that it wouldn't be unrealistic to expect that a, a case may appear. But the measure of success, I think, is how uh, one is able to contain that and make sure that it stays to just that index case without any other uh, spread around it. And so very, very um, early and... Um, um, proactive isolation of close contacts. Thank you, Dr. Conrad and uh, Mr. Noy. Thank you, Mr. Noy. And the final slide, if we could go to slide number 16, which uh, titled Additional COVID-19 Controls. And, and I think this is what I call the common sense slide. And as you can see here, um, we have implemented a mandatory uh, education program for everybody working in the camps around physical distancing and uh, approved uh, facial barriers. And this also includes our drivers that actually have to take a mandatory online training program, which includes COVID-19 controls, even before they can drive on the winter road. Much like our drivers, our camp residents are being monitored daily uh, for their temperature check and a COVID sign and symptom evaluation by medical personnel. And we've introduced and just started this week a comprehensive auditing program of compliance to our facilities uh, through our joint venture health, safety, and environment team. So uh, we we want to ensure that what we say we are doing and we are doing, and the only way to do that is by an active audit program. Um, Mr. Norton, that sort of concludes the presentation that uh, Dr. Conrad and, and I have for you on the winter road and our COVID controls, and we are open for any questions. Yeah, Masi Cho, uh, Mr. Loing, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Conrad for that, um, for your presentation. Uh, with that, I'll turn uh, this over to committee. Are there any questions or comments uh, from committee to uh, Mr. Loing or Dr. Conrad? Uh, we'll start off with uh, Emily Knockleby. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say first off, uh, congratulations on opening the road. Uh, the very first thing I ever stamped as a professional engineer was a Tibet to Contoido winter road load chart for the ice engineering company. So I have a special place in my heart for the ice road. Um, my question is about, I'm actually really pleased with everything I see here. Um, Knowing where the, the joint venture maybe started from uh, when I worked on it to where it is at now, I think this is, this is really a great improvement uh, in a very short time, actually. Um, my question is around when the trackers or the transport uh, workers are showing up into the Northwest Territories from the South. Um, before they report to you at the dispatch to be screened, etc., uh, what is the joint venture doing to ensure that they're not then um, mingling or in Yellowknife or other places uh, interacting with uh, NWT residents prior to all of the screening taking place? I do understand you're asking them questions before they, they head up, but are they actually having a test down in Edmonton or in Alberta somewhere? And yeah, is there a method in place to prevent them from uh, interacting with us until they are sort of shown to be COVID-free? Thank you. Mr. Cho, am I not be Dr. Conrad or Mr. Ling, who would like to take that? I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Noren. I think I, I'll, I'll answer that question. And, and a very, thank you for the acknowledgement of our progression on the, on the winter road. The, uh, so with, uh, with the drivers, and it's a very interesting, with, sorry, with the carriers, it's very interesting because the, the carriers, the journey on the winter road with the drivers and the carriers doesn't really start to they check into our dispatch system and then check off the winter road. But 
we've extended ourselves out to meeting with the carriers to ensure. One of the biggest tools that we've had is, is, is the government requirements for the long-haul truckers, which is registration with Protect NWT for uh, stays in the Northwest Territories over 36 hours. Um, you can appreciate with over almost 500 drivers currently registered on our system, not all 500 in the territories right now, by the way, because we sort of slowly ramp up. The 500 drivers in the system, it's very hard for us to, to monitor those drivers. So, um, you know, from the perspective, we work with the carriers so that they work with their drivers um, and then ultimately getting them to work as fast as we can uh, and putting them into our system and getting them up the road really limits their contact time in the Northwest Territories. I'll be honest with you. The drivers aren't here to spend time in Yellowknife. They're here to hit that winter road and are chomping it, uh, at the truck tires to, to get up there. So uh, one of the things that we've been working with uh, with the COVID secretariat is to begin comprehensive review as the drivers come in. We're actually working it up this week. They've given us a week to get started. They'll be coming in and we'll be doing joint auditing. Uh, they'll take a look at our drivers that are in our system so they can compare them to the ones that have registered with Protect NDT to make sure that those isolation plans are there. Um, they will be doing uh, uh, spot checks with us and throughout with all the carriers. So we've had a, uh, there'll be about four, four meetings in total with the COVID secretariat about how we're going to work together. So uh, mostly auditing to ensure compliance to the government regulations because those, those requirements are very strong. Mr. North. Thank you, Mr. Loing. Uh, supplementary, Emily Rockleby? Okay, nothing there. Uh, nothing else? Uh, so uh, do uh, any other members have any questions? Emily Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, also congratulations on opening the ice road. And I, yeah, I thank you for this presentation and the plan. I, I've had a number of constituents reach out with concerns, and, but, I, but I do think that the work both you and Protect NWT has done a, sets out a number of safety concerns. Uh, I was just hoping you could speak briefly to uh, perhaps unrelated to COVID is uh, any of the traffic calming measures you have done uh, on the Ingham Trail. I know there's been complaints in past years about drivers going too fast and you know back-to-back -back trucks. And I, I, I believe the joint venture has uh, put their mind to this, but if you could just speak to some of the mitigation measures regarding that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily Johnson, uh, Mr. Loy. Very good question, and uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the Northwest Territories, and I've always ha and lived in the Northwest Ter in the North Slave for quite a while, and always always get concerned about the truck tread myself. Uh, so what we do on the uh, Ingram Trail is uh, first off we cap the speed. So there's been some speed changes as the part uh, Department of Infrastructure has allowed. We've kept our speeds down, so they remain at 70 kilometers an hour. The trucks are dispatched uh, not right now because it's uh, we don't have but the COVID testing slowed the volume down. But at its peak, we'll have four trucks every 20 minutes. And when they're traveling down the Ingham Trail, in addition to their speed, uh, they're led by an experienced convoy leader that coaches the newer drivers. But they must maintain 1,000 meters separation while traveling on the Ingham Trail to avoid bunching or causing a lot of inconvenience uh, to, to the, the folks that live and drive down there. We also have put in uh, two blackout periods for the drivers. So from uh, 7 in the morning to 8 in the morning, we stop dispatching trucks down the winter road. And from 5 to 6 in the evening, every day, seven days a week, this allows people that are coming and working to drive in and not have to face the truck traffic, uh, the challenges that may present to them. The other thing that we do is 24 hours a day, we operate two security services vehicles. These aren't for the public. These are for the winter. They're the I will call it the police for the drivers, even though there are law enforcement on the road. And 24 hours a day, we have two security officers driving up and down the Ingram Trail. They are equipped with a radar gun. Uh, they are monitoring for unsafe behavior, crowding of center lines, speeding, seatbelt use, unsafe behavior, aggressive behavior. And these officers have the ability then to, uh, we don't find drivers, we punish them. And it sounds really draconian, but if uh, a driver doesn't follow the rules, that so we actually we meter it out in days of suspensions. And there's a rule in the handbook that goes by that. And they could have a one, three, five day suspension, a season ban or a permanent ban, uh, depending upon the, the severity of what they have. So we're fairly aggressive on the folks uh, that drive on the Ingram Trail in terms of the drivers. And we work very closely with the Ingram Trail. We just recently put out a notice to them to keep them fully informed of how we're managing traffic on the trail because it remains a concern to them, it's a concern to us. Mr. Norton. 
Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Emily Johnson has uh, no further questions. I'm just looking over. Uh, do uh, any of the members online or Collins have any questions? Uh, Emily Cleveland, line's yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Norn. Um, so just to follow up in regards to to MLA Knockleby's question, rules in Yellowknife and such, I have had some constituents reach out uh, um, just about concern about um, ice road truckers that are in town fueling up or that are not fueling up, sorry, but getting supplies and stuff like we have Walmart and whatnot um, and potential for people not following the rules. And I think that there's a twofold thing happening there where on one side, um, there is kind of a need for public education in town. But then on this, the other hand, what I'm wondering what kind of education is happening with drivers um, about the rules as far as operating within Yellowknife and, and staying compliant with, with the COVID restrictions here in town. And is that, um, I know you talked about not issuing fines, but doing kind of more of a punishment um, for people who don't follow rules of the road, are those also being handed out or a potential to hand those out to people who don't follow COVID regulations? Thank you. Mr. Joe Emily Cleveland, uh, Mr. Owing. Yeah, and that's a, an excellent question. And uh, it always comes down to where does the, where does the jurisdiction of the ice road end start and stop? And, and uh, we've, uh, and I guess in the case of once the drivers come to the territories, mm -hmm. um, we don't actually know they're here. And that's the challenge we face. Uh, until they come into our system, they're registered, and they come and get their, their what we call their uh, truck number. And you know, something very unique to any, any time that you see a uh, heavy transport truck driving down the road, and it has a uh, license plate, uh, for a funny color territorial license plate in its driver's window in the either upper uh, left or lower right, uh, sorry, upper left or lower left corner, you know that that's a, a winter road vehicle. It's very easy to distinguish, and it helps you to identify that vehicle. So until they check in with us, we very rarely know that we d just don't have the contact, other than working with the carriers to remind them that the, they have to follow the government requirements. Um, my thoughts are that if you find a, a, a person that's in a parking lot, you can always phone the carrier and speak with their health and safety team to determine maybe this is a carrier that's coming up that's working for any number of businesses in town or, or doing regular hauling, I'm not sure. It could be a territorial, could be a trucker based in the NWT. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. But once they have that ID plate, then they're very trackable to us. And you can phone our health, safety, and environment supervisor. And we'll begin an investigation if we believe there's a COVID infraction, uh, understanding that we can't give out any sort of punishment for that uh, because they're not on the winter road. They're in a, they're in a legally binding government jurisdiction. But we would certainly go and take that to protect MDT and the COVID secretariat to pursue an investigation and to validate that if there's non-compliance, then if there is, we will ban that person from the road. Thank you, Mr. Owing. Uh, uh, supplementary, uh, Emily Cleveland? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just switching directions here, Mr. Chair. I have uh, a number of constituents who use the Winter Road actually for hunting purposes um, to be able to access traditional hunting grounds. And so some of the concerns and questions have been around the, the gate that's used to close the road for safety purposes. And so I'm wondering um, if there is a potential to get some more information about when the gate is closed or when it is open. And if uh, a constituent wants to be able to access the road but the gate is closed, what the best course of action is. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Cleveland, uh, Mr. Loy. So the uh, the gate is generally kept it locked until we can uh, ensure that the road is actually safe for public travel. And in the per in the past, traditionally, the winter road has opened the road during construction, uh, which I'll be the first to admit is probably not the best way to ensure public safety. And because uh, you have portages that are unsafe, uh, roads that are being built, equipment moving around. And once we get to a point where the road is, uh, uh, is, is, is deemed safe for the public travel, that's determined by our contractor to say, I feel comfortable my family can drive on it, then we open it up to the public. Uh, this year, the, 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 the gate was kept locked for quite a period of time, and I'll be the first to admit a lot of that had to do with the extremely poor ice conditions. So uh, there was not the normal access to the winter road. Uh, that was just based on the, the long delays in building the road and the, some of the environmental conditions we face. But once the road is open, we open it. And the only time we will close it uh, is when we feel there's an imminent threat to the public. Uh, for example, there's a, a large, there's a very dangerous storm coming in. 
and we're, we've shut down the road. We're pulling people into camps. We would consider locking the gate, but it's, it's very difficult for us because we don't want to lock people on the other side of the gate. So it's a last resort, and we have a public education sign to warn the public uh, of winter storms so they don't drive into an unsafe situation. Often we're better prepared, and we find sometimes the public goes up not knowing the conditions they're about to face. But uh, as usual, we we always try to find a better way to to address public safety without restricting access and understanding that as long as the road is safe for public travel, we have we cannot lock the gate, and under our license of occupation, we have to make it accessible to the public while ensuring public safety. I hope I've answered that question, Mr. North. Yep, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Loing. Um, up next, I have uh, Emily O'Reilly. Emily O'Reilly, line's yours. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So I, I think I heard some discussion of auditing. It looks like the joint venture does its own, and maybe WSCC or COVID Secretariat does some. Maybe I can get some further details on this auditing and whether the results are shared back and forth and uh, what that really means. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, Mr. Loy. Yes, and uh, we're always open. Uh, last year, we uh, undertook a tour of the of the Winter Road with the Worker Safety and Compensation Commission to ensure that we all of our facilities meet uh, requirements under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The COVID Secretariat is a, is a new entity that we are working with, but uh, I look forward to the joint auditing programs. Uh, we've uh, uh, so far the uh, They've in, uh, the COVID secretary has indicated they, they will start their auditing and when need interact with us other than the ones that we've asked to, to do joint ones with. So I, I, I will certainly look forward to sharing results uh, in a confidential way. But yes, those uh, our documents can be made available to any regulator. Uh, full transparency. Thank you, Mr. Lowing. Uh, supplementary, uh, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So maybe I can just get a little bit more detail about what the auditing is really going to be looking at. Um, you know, is it to make sure that all of the uh, people uh, uh, operating on the road have been properly screened and tested? Uh, um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of safety stuff going on, which is great, but uh, I guess I'm interested in what specifically is going to be audited in terms of uh, COVID-related compliance. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, Mr. Loing. No, excellent question. And, uh, you know, as we, as we move forward, the audit, the, so the audit, auditing programs that we're just wrapping up this week because uh, our, our joint venture health and safety teams are now in the camps are to begin to look at uh, fundamentally, and I'll be upfront and honest, compliance to the basically facial barriers and, uh, and the uh, physical distancing requirements. If we're, if we're going to protect people from COVID, testing is a great thing. But if we're going to prevent COVID from spreading, uh, those two controls by far the, the strongest. Uh, we've started in our camps w with these programs um, and uh, already a mixed bag of results, I'll be honest with you. When people work in a, in a remote camp, um, the, they're, they're very social in that you work with people for long days on end in a very small environment. You tend to, I, the, the physical distancing decreases, you know, one day it's two meters, the next thing it's 1.5, now you're down to 1.3. So that's the first auditing underway. Uh, at the end of this week, we'll be auditing training records to ensure compliance. Uh, and that's meeting actually a WSCC requirement on training. The next step will be for us to begin to audit the drivers as they come in to ensure compliance, uh, that they are registered with Protect on WT. And uh, as we go through, that's the sort of the, the, the three major that we've got started with in the next two weeks. Uh, so for us to, to, to get started on that and get grounded and figure out where our successes are, and we, most importantly, we don't want to audit them to death. We want to audit, find where the improvements are, make the changes, and then re-audit again. So already we've, uh, for example, the auditing that we found at one of our camps found facial barrier use and physical distancing to be weak at best, I'll be honest. So we addressed that by putting in a mandatory mask policy. Regardless of physical distancing, it doesn't matter. Whenever you walk into any one of our remote camps, you must wear an approved surgical mask, not your own personal one, the one that we give you, and now it's mandatory. So that's an example of where we found a deficiency through auditing, and now we're making a change, and now within a week we'll go back and re-audit compliance. Mr. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Lowing. Um, uh, do I have any other questions uh, from the members uh, calling in? Okay, I don't hear any. Uh, I did have a couple of questions. Um, 
Um, and turning to slide 11, uh, there is some mention about the PCR test, and I guess just uh, for the benefit of our viewers too as well. Uh, uh, just can you just, uh, my question is, what is the turnaround time from when uh, drivers tested to getting a result for that PCR test? I'll, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll answer that question then. So what we are doing on the winter road because uh, of the complexity, most of our testing uh, is people flying in. We test them and we have a few hours to sort through them before they fly out. The drivers are a bit of a different situation. Uh, unfortunately, we have limited testing ability, meaning that we can process in its current configuration with the private sector provider. That's how we're doing the testing for us. Uh, this company can only do 15 tests every 2.5 hours. So what we've done is we've changed our, our testing, our dispatch timeframes. Right now it's four trucks every every hour, and we're getting to see how well the testing company can keep up with it. Then we'll move it to four trucks every uh, 40 minutes, and then hopefully on our regular schedule, four trucks every 20 minutes. Uh, the drivers are allowed to proceed after being medically screened and tested. Uh, they're, they're pretty well confined to their trucks on the next eight hours that they travel up the winter road. And during that time frame, it gives our testing facility to deal with the large volume of tests. And the results could take anywhere from uh, two to four to five hours, maybe six at the, at the top. And this is, six is the real, the, not when I say worst case, that's the longest it could be. By that point, uh, after an eight-hour journey, eight to ten hour, eight to nine hour, depending upon uh, if they've had any issues, they'll arrive at our Lockhart operations, which is a closed facility. It's at that point that if a driver is found to have been tested positive, they will be, as the, it's a mandatory that they have to stop at Lockhart. There's no way by which they can bypass it. The driver will pull in, they'll be met by a team, and uh, the driver will be stood down discreetly. We don't get on a radio and say this. Uh, we'll talk to the driver. Uh, they'll do what we call dolly off the load, remove their trailer that they're hauling. There'll be a medical assessment to determine that the driver is fit. Generally, as a rule, if they made it that far, they're either asymptomatic or may have mild symptoms because uh, they've already passed a medical screening. Then the driver will self-extract or drive back to Yellowknife under escort. Uh, we will bring them back. Of course, at that point, uh, we have a, a quick phone call through our immediate phone call through to Dr. Conrad and Dr. Withers to begin, discuss the management plan for the driver. And then we work with the carrier, with the CPHO, then to ensure that that driver goes into quarantine and then the management plan is developed. Mr. Norton. Okay, thank you for the answer. And I, I just had uh, one, uh, not so much a question, more of a comment. I think it's, uh, I think your team is doing a great job with uh, their Aboriginal business uh, and the Northern business. And I wanted to commend uh, you folks for that. And uh, and uh, um, I'd like to turn over the, the line over to the Premier shortly, see if she has any comments. But uh, I just want to yeah, thank you for, for everything and uh, I wish you all the best uh, this uh, winter road season. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, so with that, um, and I don't hear any of the questions from Kennedy, does um, Madam Premier, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Um, don't need. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank um, Mr. Lowing and uh, Dr. Conrad for coming today. Um, everyone knows around the table that uh, the mining industry is a huge part of our GDP in the Northwest Territories. Um, I want to congratulate all of you for working with our CPHO. We, on our side, the GNWT, we recognize that we want to keep our minds open. Uh, there's a huge amount of people that in the Northwest Territories that are employed with that. And I really congratulate the minds, uh, Mr. Chair, for, for being willing to work with us and the measures that they have in place, including joint venture, ventures. Uh, it's important, and uh, they are doing their part as corporate citizens. And I, again, want to say thank you for the work. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mashisho, um, Madam Premier. Uh, and so with that, uh, this concludes the, the public portion of our meeting. Uh, committee will now move in uh, camera for a wrap, quick wrap-up discussion. Um, and uh, again, yeah, thank you uh, for everybody joining in uh, with us. And uh, do I have a motion to go in camera? Emily Knuckleby. So we'll just take a short uh, two-minute break, and uh, we'll... Um, we'll uh, Continue on with the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Long